conceptual people talk Real about talk, it, it throwing shots. all of the elements and we are live all right, family, welcome, welcome to the Empower Hour. I am Al Kumar. And I am Hanifa. <laughs> and we are reporting to you live on Zoom today uh, with two good brothers, good brothers, activists in the community, um, worldwide community, I should say, because uh, Brother Ola at the top is coming to us all the way from London by London, by way of Nigeria, correct? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're in, London. Yeah. you're in London right now. Yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us. And underneath him, you have Brother Rick Wallace. And a, a lot of you may be familiar with his face because he's been on several uh, programs and, and, um, and um, videos and all kind of things. He, he's just out there. He's out there in the airwaves and he's, uh, his voice is very prevalent in the community. So thank you so much, uh, Rick, for joining the discussion. Uh, it's an honor, it's an honor. Thanks for inviting me. So the topic is bridging the gap. Um, black men versus black women. And Hanifa, you know I had some pushback this time there are a couple of people inbox me. What is up with that? The verses. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, just tune in, tune in. So I think <laughs> come on that, in and find out. <laughs> come on in and find out. That's the best way to do it, right? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so let's jump right into the discussion. Um, family, what do you guys, and anybody can um, can start. What do, what do you see out here currently as it relates to the relationships between black men and women what is your perspective is it fine does it need assistance are we like in shambles do we need a little work a whole lot give me give me your perspective so before we get into that i'm sorry mm -hmm. so i just kind of want to put it out there for anyone that's watching and also for the brothers that we have on um we did a part one with the woman so it was Alkama, myself, and Sister Oni. And uh, we are discussing bridging the gap because uh, specifically around this election time here in America, um, a lot of conversation begin to resurface because these conversations are ongoing um, as it pertains to uh, just, the, just kind of building a narrative around this black man versus black woman thing as usual. Anytime that something happens, you know, um, people start creating this rhetoric around uh, black men being against black women or black women being against black men. And so the first part were the woman mm -hmm. talking about what we can specifically do as women to bridge that gap if there is one at all. So that was part one. So part two, because we were, we are women, we did not want to speak for our brothers. And therefore <laughs> we went out there on the quest to find some brothers to come in here and represent and allow us to ask you guys some questions around what needs to be done on the part of our brothers to bridge that gap. So I just kind of wanted to put that in perspective, put the um, conversation today in context. So sorry, Alkama, you were asking. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Hanifa. <laughs> So again, the question, what is your, what is your visual as it relates to um, our relationships currently, current day? Uh, well, I don't mind setting that off. Um, there's, two, there's two ends of the coin. That's what I'm seeing. There's the end of the coin. There's one side where, you know, there's, there's brothers and sisters who you know, see the importance of, you know, um, bridging that gap and, you know, building and starting a foundation with, you know, coming together to, you know, get into uh, a, a long-term relationship. You know, there's brothers and sisters right now who are, you know, on the verge of being married. 
Um, there's a lot of black love being promoted on social media. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on the other side of the coin, there's a lot of dysfunctionality, you know, and I think um, now we're in this digital era, there's a lot of dysfunctionality which is being highlighted. And that's, you know, because we, you know, the, 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 we as a people, not saying everybody, but, you know, um, um, people amongst us uh, feed the machine. You know, they feed the machine and people express what they're going through personally um, on, you know, this, this, this machine. And uh, from those what, you know, just log on to social media, they might wake up or they, want, they might be doing their business or trying to interact with whoever, they're going to see this dysfunctionality and consistently down their timeline where, um, you know, to all of those who are watching, just sees that you know this there's a consistent um ongoing never-ending battle between the black man and black woman mm -hmm. so you know those are the two those are the two um ends of the coin which i see okay are you um are you acknowledging that are you saying that there is a gap or uh maybe the gap is not as big as we think it is and it's just being kind of manipulated yeah, so I think I think there is a gap. Okay. However, you know, there are those out there who are just not, you know, feeding into that rhetoric and, uh, you know, see and have hope that there's still black love out there. But as I said, now we're in a digital era. Uh, that gap uh, is being more highlighted. Okay because you know a lot of people are feeding in, into that machine because of their personal um you know previous experiences with relationships which didn't um go too well so we're using this platform uh, as a venting uh, as a venting tool mm. you know um without getting the support um needed to heal uh in order to you know just do the you know the, the, the self-reflective work or whatever is necessary uh so they can jump back on that 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 uh that, that saddle. Okay. Okay. I got it. Brother Rick, uh, same question. What do you foresee or see as you are, you know, um, moving about and having your ear to the ground and, you know, paying attention to the social media uh, atmosphere? What, what is your overall perspective as where we stand in our relationships today? Well, uh, I think you may know, I'm not sure if uh, everyone else knows, but my approach to uh, the enigmatic issues of my people is primarily focused on the psychological uh, impact and the psychological influences. So to answer this question, I'll go all the way back to 70 years ago, uh, uh, France Fanon uh, told us the force and the power of colonialism. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, uh, Dr. Naeem Agbar, Dr. Amos Wilson, uh, Dr. Joy DeGru, uh, Dr. Howard Stevenson all have talked about the influences from a psychological uh, perspective. Is there a gap? Yes. Is it as huge as the media and uh, the, uh, the forces that be make it out to be? No, because there's this idea that black men prefer white women when 88% of married black men marry black women. That's right. Uh, so I, I think that we have to be careful of the narrative that's being written in mainstream media and social media, because again, uh, like my brother said, we tend to play off of our emotions and our personal experiences and just here in America alone, we're talking about 45 to 48 million people. Mm -hmm. And we can't assume that everyone's experiences is, are I, uh, identical to our own. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to go out and look and see the truth of what's happening. There's a lot of black love out there, mm -hmm. but that's not going to get the press. That's not going to get the airtime. That's not going to be put out in front. What's going to be put out in front is the dysfunctionality. Again, as my brother stated, that's going to be highlighted because why? They know the force of the media. They know what propaganda does. If I present this image 
consistently enough, it becomes truth. Mm. Mm. And so what, what, what you get is a constant play. And every time there's a chance, it's highlighted. Let a black man say anything positive about a white woman and negative about a black woman. And it becomes the black man's ideal. And it's not true. It's that person's way of thinking. And then we're not even looking into the psychological makeup of what made him. We're not yeah. dealing with the fact that we have our own internal issues of colorism. Yes. Uh, that drive a lot of that. And so it's easy to be upset. And I'll, I'll end uh, my answer by saying one of the things that I do, I created uh, and designed Black Men Lead, which is, a rite, which is a rite of passage initiative for young Black males. And the first thing that we teach is the respect of the Black woman mm -hmm. at all ages. Uh, no harm can be brought to that your number one responsibility is to protect uh, my call to black men is to love black women back to life. We've got to understand how our black women got to where they are. And we have to ask, we, we love to be called kings. We love to say that we're the head of the home, but we don't always understand the gravity of that role and what that means. And the fact that we are responsible for covering our women, not because of how we feel, but because that's what we're supposed to do. So it doesn't matter if I'm happy with you today. I tell my wife all the time, it doesn't matter if I'm, if I like you today or not, I love you. Mm -hmm. And so how I treat you will never change. Whether I'm mad at you, whether we're in one of our not on the same page moments, you will never know the difference. I walk to you, I walk you to your car every morning, kiss you and put you in your car. I hold you every night. Not because we're on the same page all the time, but because that's what I'm going to, I'm never going to let you feel distance mm -hmm. between us because you've got, you've had enough of that. And so the responsibility of the black man to, to end, to end this particular answer is to be able to get outside of ourselves because we've been beat up. We've been battered. Our, uh, you know, there's so much that we could talk about. That's not right for us, that it's easy to sit up and look for the closest thing to us to blame. And we have to be careful for that, careful and careful about that. So my thing is, uh, in agreement with him, we can we can decide what side of the coin we're going to be on. And I choose unity and love, and not to ignore the 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 the, the gaps that are there. And you know, I can't ignore because I literally counsel black women. I can't ignore that the second leading cause of death for black women between the age of 15 and 44 is intimate partner homicide predominantly by black men. I can't ignore that. I see it all the time. I deal with it. But that can't be our truth. We need to deal with that. We need to have, a, I've said this for a long time, we need to have a code of conduct in the black mm -hmm. community that immediately deals with that type of behavior. When an elderly person, a woman or a child is harmed, that needs to be dealt with. And we, we don't need to wait on the system. We don't need to wait. We need to be able to protect our women. That's another part of the distance and the gap. Mm -hmm. We're not, our women don't trust us. So, I, my, okay, so I've listened, after listening to both of you guys, as I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm like, those of us that know that there's a lot of propaganda, there's almost in a sense an agenda, right? Mm -hmm. we understand that um but there's a lot of us that don't understand that there's some of us who are dealing with situations in which you just mentioned domestic violence okay some of us know people who were hurt by black men or a black man um so even though those of us that know we can kind of sift through it but then there are those who are just going based off of their experiences with those within closest proximity to them, right? My question is, as far as the gap, because I am one who truly, I really believe the gap is exaggerated. But I do believe there is somewhat of a gap there. And I do understand the macro of it white terrorism white supremacy i do understand that but i'm of the mind where i could understand that and also be realistic about the micro which is personal responsibility on us right mm -hmm. 
what I have, what I re, what I do understand is is knowledge. For example, you could have the knowledge, and I'm more concerned about the people who don't have the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, because these are the people who they're using as examples to say, you see, this is how these people are, right? And these people don't have enough knowledge of self to be able to say, no, this is my experience. This is not black men. How do we begin to engage that part of the population, that part of the community um, in discussing what they consider to be a straight up gender war between mm -hmm. black men and black women? How do we begin to approach well, one thing I would say is change, change, change the narrative, you know, and that's what you're doing right now, Sister Hanifa. You know, you and Sister Alcamore have platforms like this um, with, you know, whether it's, you know, yourself with the, who shares that knowledge or, you know, bringing brothers like yeah. us on the show, you know, to um, share, you know, our knowledge and experience and our perspective on what, you know, that means, you know, and if we continue to, um, you know, uh, create platforms like this and, you know, just just continue to push it out there and so forth, people would then see that, you know, things are not what it seems to be, you know, and one, one, one thing we need to uh, understand is like the whole, like algorithms, you know, how these, um, uh, white supremacists use the the whole online domain when it comes to algorithms. You know, see, like for example, even when you're going on your phone and you might purchase something, then the next minute you'll see that what you've purchased, you know, appears on <laughs> you know your homepage and so forth. So what they do is they push um, those those algorithms um, in order, and even what you're clicking on just to, 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 um, to see the dysfunctionality. So they know if you've been interacting yes. with that dysfunctionality, it's, it's, it, it just, that deception just, um, starts to become your reality. Hmm. So this is something we need to be aware of because um, if we don't like understand how the, the machine functions, then we're just only going to get that one-sided one -sided part of the coin. Good point. Yep. Yeah. Brother Wick, you want to dive into that same question? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I agree exactly what I said, uh, what, what my brother said. Here, here's my take on it. Uh, you mentioned personal responsibility mm -hmm. as a part of the micro response or the micro uh, engagement of it all. And that's always going to be my ultimate point when we're talking about white supremacy, racism, when we're talking about propaganda when we're talking about all of the different things that we face as a collective uh both here and abroad it's always going to be yes that's it but we are a unique and powerful people we have the ability and the capacity to overcome it but we have to know who we are how they attack us is through identity crisis hmm. if i can convince you that you're not who you really are you will be you will behave as that what you believe yourself to be. That's been proven over and over again. One of the mechanisms I use when working with my clients is called psycho-cybernetics. What it is, it means that once you believe that you're a certain thing, you'll change your behavior through your will if you want something different. But if you don't change the setting of the th thermostat in your mind that says, this is who I am, you will automatically hit the automatic. It's like a thermostat. That's a cybernetic, that's a cybernetic uh, mechanism. You set the thermostat at 75. If it gets too hot, the AC comes on. If it gets too cold, the heat comes on. It's going to consistently set at 75 until you change the temperature. If you never change the temperature, you can open the doors, turn the fans on. It's going to keep adjusting to keep it at 75. The same thing with us. Until we change the temperature of our identity to reveal and represent the power we possess we will continue to behave and act powerless. Yeah. We will continue to ask those who don't really truly have power of us to execute power and tell us what to do, how to do, and do for us. And so that's the gameplay. They consistently feed us the narrative via media 
of who we are. And as long as they can keep us confused, there's a reason why they went all out and beyond to get Dave Chappelle to wear that dress that he refused to wear. Mm -hmm. And they lost their mind and him and Hollywood fell out and he literally left the country for years because there's a force behind that. There's a purpose behind that. There's absolutely nothing that they do that does not have purpose. And it's people like ourselves that have to sit up and say, okay, it's not just good enough for me to know it. It's not just good enough for me to share it on my platform. I have to literally claim my voice and become so outspoken and forceful that I'm heard. I have to be so radical in my speech. And if you look at the voices, the, um, the Naeem Akbars, the Francis Cress Wilsons, the Neely Fuller Juniors, uh, you know, radical, their thoughts and the way they presented themselves didn't give credence to the suggestions of white supremacy. I, I'm, I'm not trying to please the system. I'm not trying to adapt and operate within the system. I have a uniqueness. My approach is always Afrocentric. And it's in that that our power lies. We, we are yeah. that unique. Mm -hmm. I'm, glad, I'm sorry, Alkama. I'm glad you said that because there's two things. Um, I've kind of been on this this own self journey just about re redefining and one of the things that i'm realizing is that even when you think that you're like you're can you know people have these labels of conscious you know you're a conscious man you're a conscious woman or um you find even as you begin to do self work you are going to buck up against white supremacy within yourself right absolutely and so even like how they have defined like this morning i be i was processing how much of our power we have lost by embracing feminine fem, feminism as black women right mm -hmm. I, I i was just processing that so we've given up so much of our power just so that we could be validated and uh be with in close proximity. In other words, you know, people say um, that movie where you say uh, Malcolm X, I think had, did a speech and he was saying when the master was sick, you know, the slave would say, oh, we sick? Boss, <laughs> boss we sick? Right. And and so I, I thought of um, the feminist movement in that sense, where it's like somehow we got tricked into believing their struggle was ours, right, as women. And we actually sacrificed or gave up a lot of our power Mm -hmm. as black woman and so as i was processing i'm like you know even manhood as this was since we're talking about this you know in how they try to define ma manhood and how much so many of us as women jump on that and project that onto our men and i said that to get into the question of there has been this ongoing conversation we've talked about it on our show before around protection okay Black women not feeling protected by black men. That is an ongoing conversation. It is a serious conversation as well. Um, we've seen some videos where if, if someone wanted to, they could take that video and run with it and say, see, <laughs> I told you, black men don't protect black women. What do you guys have to say to that narrative that's being pushed to where a black women, some black women are saying, I don't feel protected by black men. And let me just say this. I have learned that when women say that, they are not saying, um, they're not speaking because they know all black men. What, what I'm often getting out of that is when you go back into their childhood, they've never, because of the men who have, may have violated them. Um, I know from my own experience, it might not even be directly, it could be indirectly, where you just seen abuse in your family and the men did nothing or whatever so now you're talking about women now they're adults and they've reached this point and there is this machine right feeding that part of them their self they're you know pretty much exploiting or pulling on their own trauma right and woman and, and and some women just can't really sift through that and say you know what i need some healing what do you guys say to the narrative that is being pushed around black men are not protective of black women 
outside of the machine pushing it. Is that a thing that you see or is it just something that black women are make, um, they're making up? You know what? I like the way you speak. I should have got you for, um, as one of my panelists for my event next week, Saturday. Because <laughs> we're going to be, this top, these topics are going to be um, spoken about, you know, in my event. Um, how can our brothers protect our sisters' well-being? You know, because there's so many different angles uh, we, you, we could come at. So both um, our brothers and sisters can learn from each other. Um, one thing I would say, um, you know, you highlighted, you highlighted yourself. Uh, this goes back to childhood um, with, uh, and their, just their timeline in general with um, the, 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 the brothers who have been inconsistent, you know, whether that's been inconsistent as fathers, inconsistent as, um, when I mean far, yeah, inconsistent as their, you know, their fathers or, you know, fathers to their children, uh, like failed marriages and so forth. And, you know, what, one thing what doesn't help is when we switch on the TV mm. and we're watching all of these uh, type of uh, reality shows, which keeps, keeps on throwing out those projections. You know, because that's that's how it um, programs the the uh, our subconscious mind. So when that programs our subconscious mind, that's the that we're gonna start to uh, believe that's you know that, uh, we're gonna run with basically run with that narrative. You know, so a lot of sisters were running with that narrative, and you know, then you know they will probably you know share their experiences with their girlfriends and so forth who've had similar experiences, then in that own bubble, they're gonna see life from the perspective as there's no good brothers out there, you know, because that's their own reality. You understand, you understand where I'm coming from? So at the end of the day, we, you know, you know, as 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 the brother mentioned earlier, it's about, you know, taking taking that power, you know, taking back that power um you know just just standing firm and um also you know um just 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 being in tune like healing you know it's something which a lot of folks run away from and feel that they you know that you know whenever someone suggests it it's like you know you're going to be sent to the electric chair or something like that you know, I know it's not a process which is which which is easy, but we have to, you know, we have to uh, embrace it. We have to embrace it and do do that work in if in order for us to, um, you know, make those changes. Mm -hmm. Brother Rick, I have, you know, when we get into these type of discussions, I'm always cautious on not speaking above the audience because we have people from all different perspectives of thought that join these discussions. Um, and so I want us to, well, you to break down for us, um, for those who may not understand why, 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 why do I have to heal? Heal from what? What must I understand about oppression? What is, a, what is the, you know, anybody oppressing me have to do with my relationship going spoiling? I mean, can you connect? Why do I have to be, stay on a code of conduct? What code of conduct? So can you kind of break down for us in layman's terms, what are we talking about here? Why, why, you know, why is it so important for those who may not understand and may not see the, 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 uh, the wizard behind the curtain <laughs> pulling all the levers and who that is, what that is, why they're doing it. I mean, can you in, 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 in a few minutes break down for us or for those who may not understand how that relates to our relationships being divided or divisive, I should say. That it boils down to trauma. Uh, and when I think about trauma, I think about Dr. Joy DeGruy, I think about Dr. Naeem Arbar, I think about Dr. Howard Stevenson, uh, all who shoulder I've stood on in my research. And 
it comes down to this. It comes down to trauma and it comes down to healing. And then people say, okay, what's all that about and why is it? Because we hear a lot about it. We see all the memes, but what happens with trauma is it li literally puts an imprint, not just mentally, but literally physiologically into you. You're triggered by things that remind you of past traumas and you respond mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and physically based off of that. So say for instance, you were traumatized as a child. And here's uh, 20 years ago, I called a colleague because I was noticing this, um, this, this crazy phenomenon when I was treating black women. And I said, hey, look, is it me? Or is it just every black woman who's ever been molested as a child is choosing me? to come to for help or do we have a problem that we're not addressing mm. he said no i got the same thing and so we started looking for data that represented what we were experiencing and it hadn't been done yet but we started to learn that when we started asking and taking surveys and doing short studies that we found out that as high as 60 to 65 percent of black women have been violated as a child that goes your that goes your trauma well, here's the problem with trauma. One of the primary components are, are cast off or side effects of trauma is the lack of trust. You stop trusting. Mm. You don't trust people. You don't trust your environment. And when you don't trust, you can't take action. So you're frozen. So what happens is this thing we call the familiar past, your mind starts to re your your brain and your mind can function in primarily two different ways as a record of your past or a map of your future when you're dealing with trauma it becomes a record of your past the problem with your brain being a complete record of your past or an archive and you're operating off of that is it gives you this predictable future you're going to pretty much get what you've always gotten because you're literally living off of past experiences and you're never using your mind at the imaginary function or the imagination to create a reality that you haven't experienced yet, which is how you change. You have to see something different in order to have something different. The problem is with trauma, it doesn't. So we get constantly reminded of our trauma in little subliminal ways that trigger us. And that comes the dissension between us because uh, most of us have experienced our trauma from someone of the opposite sex. Most men who've been traumatized are traumatized by their mom. Most women who were traumatized were traumatized by their dad, their uncle, or their older brothers or cousins. So early on, the very people who should have protected you violated you. Now, who can I trust? So brother Rick, I have a question about that. Um, <laughs> I just had this experience yesterday. Um, I had a, a um, I work in child welfare. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was a situation where one of the, the kids were able to articulate what they, why they disrespect the woman around them. He mm -hmm. little, little, little boy. And I was really um, imp impressed with it. I was like, okay, but we need to hear that as young as he is, he's actually telling you. And um, I think one of the things that we don't put into perspective as black women, we get so caught up in our own traumas as black women that we don't put into perspective the traumas of black men, okay? Um, there is a population of our black men who have been violated by women okay like by woman even though they don't see it as rape okay it still has an effect on how they relate to black women then also i always talk to women who talk about men who disrespect women and say i get that and i know it makes us uncomfortable and we want to rip his head off for the most part you know what i'm saying you call it my sister's bitches and whatever else and I always go back to, but you do not know what the black woman in his life represented for him, right? And what I mean by that is I'm talking about some of probably some of the most, the most demeaning things that were said to that brother have been from black women, his aunties, his grandmother, his mother. And then here we are trying to do relationship, right? With these men 
and we're coming in there and we're saying we want the brothers to understand that we have a traumatic past, but we don't put into perspective that they may have, you know, a traumatic past as well. I think what's happening is that there are more spaces for women to deal with these <laughs> these issues we have the sister circles and everything else going on you know um retreats and all sorts of things there's so many resources for us and i don't i i want to see more resources for our brothers because i think it's so yeah. necessary and it is so needed because if we're trying to do this thing together we're talking about bridging the gap then we need to be in support of that we can't just be focused on the woman stuff i want to see that for our brothers I cannot facilitate that. I am a woman. I actually think that we need men like you guys to facilitate those type of things. I don't get, take a retreat, call it a guy's trip, whatever y'all want to call it, go sip on some coconuts and kind of like sift through, you know, sort through some things. But how much of how, let's say the, let's say they're talking about like the lack of support, uh, protection, and any of you guys can answer this. How many, how much of that do you guys think is rooted in traumatic experiences with with our brother that our brothers have went through you want to take you want to take this or you want me to want, want me to jump on it um i'm either way either way um i'm gonna defer to you you uh you go ahead i think it's a loaded question um <laughs> it is <definitely. laughs> well well you know, I, I agree. First and foremost, I, I, I agree. Um, you know, for me, I've got, you know, I, I am founding member of a um, project called the Man in the Mirror Project. And uh, the idea just, you know, springboarded from a documentary called The Man in the Mirror. And what influenced me to um, um, produce it was my own personal experience, um, you know, growing up, um, being traumatized, whether that's um, through from sexual abuse, being placed in foster care, um, institutionalized racism, the list goes on. And when I, you know, I, when I when I put this documentary out there, I didn't have no vision of it going further than you know the community space geographically where I where I was in but then it kind of reached to different parts of the United Kingdom and overseas you know um, and one thing I, um, I would say is you know I was kind of influenced to do like more kind of talks uh, like lectures and so forth but um, I guess from my walks of life, you know, connect with people overseas and just in different parts of the diaspora. It's, it's influenced me to, um, you know, recently kind of, you know, put ideas together and also start um, Zoom, Zoom sessions, you know, for uh, brothers who are vulnerable because, you know, now, now everything's kind of changed. You know, I'm more used to doing like face-to-face -face work and so forth, you know, just face to face, whether it, whether it's workshops or whatever I'm doing. And now I'm trying to get used to all of this online stuff. So, um, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing, brother, because obviously you also have your, you know, rights of passage program, which you've mentioned, which I'm sure has been very effective and so forth. But if you're go if we're going back historically, you know, we we could go back, you know, as far as you know. Um, when there was, um, you know, um, if oh, term is it butt breaking? If I'm um, yes, that's it. The term butt breaking on the on the plantation, and you know those the the the, the brothers being traumatized from that. And when we have um, the whole intergenerational trauma thing, which plays out, um, this is just this is just something which is just. It's I don't know even where if you want to take if you want to take away brother if you want to if you want to add to it because there there's so much there's so much heavy. to unpack yeah it's absolutely so much to unpack that it can't possibly be done in one segment if even, even if we were taking a two hour segment just in dealing with trauma uh, I think that something was mentioned in the 
intro to this particular question. And it was that women have all of these outlets, women have all these programs, women have all these spaces and men don't. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do at the Odyssey Project is create spaces uh, that give men permission to talk about the trauma. See, the thing is, there's this idea that talking about being hurt is somehow unmanly, that, oh. it, la that it lacks masculinity. Oh, and so Black men have been conditioned and trained to bottle up the hurt and pain. And the problem is anything that's bottled up and building up will eventually explode. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're not talking about. We're not talking about, we talk, we, we get the media to put it on front street when a brother breaks. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about how he got there. Nobody is born on a collision course Good with teacher. murder. Good teacher. That is mm -hmm. a situation that took place that wasn't dealt with. And then that was another maligned and, 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 and misapplied situation, whatever it is, that took place after that. You go back, you talk about the buck breaking. There was so much that went on to steal the manhood of the black man because they understood that uh, once the ability of the black man was taken away to protect the black woman, so would his manhood and manliness go away because we are built to defend and protect. That's why when you couldn't break one, you sold him off. Yeah, and you place him on a day to fight. Right because now. he would literally die to protect that woman and that child. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't have that happen on your plantation. Mm -hmm. So you sold him off and, and then eventually he would become broken because he could never connect. And that also leads to this issue we have with black men not being able to stay. It's been, you know, you go through 400 years, well, 246 years of slavery, 246, 249 years of actual slavery, but then you got a situation that comes out of that. We act like when people talk about what well, slavery ended in 1865, that was 150, you act like when we walked off the plantation, we walked into mansions. Yeah. And we actually got the 40 acres and a mule. When the truth of it is, you put in black codes. You came up with 12 years of reconstruction where you pretty much brought the South back to what it was before the Civil War. And we didn't have any rights. You sit up and did uh, convict leasing to where literally being a vagrant became a felony and you put us in jail for being homeless, and then you gave us black to the plantation masters that we actually were free from for pennies on the dollar of which we got none of the pennies. Okay, and we can go on and on with red, redlining and benign neglect and mass incarceration. We can just talk about the whole racial caste system all the way up until now, it hasn't stopped. And tell me, what at what point did we get this treatment for our trauma? You sent a soldier over to Iran, you send a soldier over to Afghanistan, you send them anywhere where there's actual conflict, where lives are being lost. And they're over there for six months. When they come back, they've got to be treated for years for post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. That was six months. We've been dealing with it and passing it down, not just through learning, learning theory and social engagement, but genetically, right. epigenetically, we're passing it down. That's and right. you tell me, if we don't deal with it, we're going to have these situations. You take someone who was meant to express his power and you suppress it over and over and over and over again. That's where your adolescent, uh, the vast majority of your adolescent violence comes from. You know, yeah. um, Brother Rick, I have a quick question to just declare up. You were saying, um, and then we wonder why black men don't stay. Are you talking about stay like in relationships? Right. Okay. I wasn't clear right. on that. And then the yeah. other thing is, um, I just saw someone that just mentioned in the comment section, victim mentality, stop making excuses, bug breaking, it's 2020. Now, <laughs> one of the things that I do, this is why the Joy DeGroy, the Amos Wilson, this is why the psychological part of this needs to really come to the forefront because mm -hmm. I don't think we understand how that works. Right. Yeah. You can have, I can be traumatized and that trauma is, can touch my great, great, great granddaughter if 
it's not dealt with at any point in any generation. Right. A part of it that happens to us, and I'm going to let you guys speak to that comment. I'm just saying a part of it that happens to, the part of what happens to us is the dysfunctionality that that trauma has created. We have normalized it. Yes. Right? Yeah. And we have even begun to call it culture. Mm. For us to function in this, to, to stay sane in this society, we almost have to be insane. Okay? Yeah. That's almost how it is. So when when that when I saw that camera, I'm sorry, I was a little triggered by that because <laughs> I'm just like the psychological aspect of tr like of it and the effects on a cellular level. Yeah. On a cellular level, on a molecular level, we do not understand that. It, so it, 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 it was so long ago. So to talk about it now as to why we're having the issues we're having, some people look at it as we are just trying to make excuses. There are some of us who we don't even know yeah. that this thing is, like you just said, is affecting us today. We right, don't know clearly. And here's why the, our, con uh, the, our relationships are in the current condition they're in. You know, we can say that, but then we don't understand why things are such and such disarray and you cannot get back on course and on track until you get the root causes and the historical relevancy of why we find ourselves in this current day condition. So for somebody to say that, which a lot of people would agree with, with, who, with that, when I'm glad they, they said that because now it gives what, us what? an opportunity to, to address it. But when they say things like that, it just cl it's clear for me that they don't get the root. They don't understand it on a deeper level. But right. any others you guys want to share? <clears throat> right. Uh, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm going to go right back and I'm going to connect it. Um, on the Like I said, I, I've uh, been blessed to stand on the shoulders uh, of some of the most unbelievable psychologists. Like I said, one of my favorites uh, of all time is Dr. Amos Wilson, but also uh, Dr. Naomi Albar, Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. Dr. Wilson, uh, God bless her soul, is actually the reason I went into psychology. Wow. 1985, she's on the Donahue show on the heels of this push by mainstream media and, uh, and, and the, uh, the system to push black intellectual inferiority, which was the late 70s, early 80s. It was this thing, they used uh, IQ tests in which black students were testing on an average of 15 points lower than white kids. And there's an element in it that deals with language, which is actually the, the white kid is gonna be exposed to correct grammar just by culture more than the black kid. And it was being counted against black children. But we find out when we dealt with that, later on down the line that it balanced out and we actually performed better. But Dr. Wilson was on uh, Phil Donahue's show and she was holding her own defending the Chris theory of color confrontation. And that I said, man, who is this woman? And so that started it. But all of these people that I've mentioned, France Fanon, all the way back to the 1950s, France Fanon on up, we, we've got to deal with this. They set the stage. My research was to take what Dr. DeGruy had did as far as post-traumatic slave syndrome and to really look at the intergenerational transmission of trauma and how it takes place on multiple levels. And we want to talk about epigenetics, the genetic passing down of trauma through epigenetic tags and experiences. So it's literally passed on to the child and it, it started with the study of twins how the experiences of twin, identical twins as they got older became more distinct and you could easily tell them apart the because they were living two different lives and their lives were actually taking a place. They share, they share the exact same DNA, but the more distinct their life experiences were, the more distinct they became visually. One may have come up with cancer, one may be healthy. Why? Life experiences, your, li your, li your literal experiences will down-regulate genes, up-regulate genes, make you more susceptible to cancer, make you more acceptable to diabetes, all other diseases, it's there. But here's the thing, in studying that, I also study the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust. And this is where it got interesting. I found this study, epigenetic study on the Jewish Holocaust. And that was this part where 
the grandchildren of Holocaust survivors who were never a part of the Holocaust and purposely had not been told about certain things were having dreams about what their grandparents experienced. And so I said, okay, we got, we got something here. So we're talking about something on a level you can't imagine. Here's the problem. I don't care if it was 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. If you didn't deal with it, traumatize mm -hmm. people, traumatize people. Pretty much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And if there's no framework um, which is um, presented to deal with that, then, you know, in regards to the, the comments, sorry, I can't even see the comment section just because of how things are displayed and so forth. So if you, you know, if you don't have no framework, then it, how would it be uh, an excuse? Um, but, but, see, but you gotta go, you, you have to actually understand when someone says that's an excuse, that's actually been grilled into the head of the black man, that he cannot have any excuses, that it's either you're gonna do it or you, you're coming up with an excuse. My, my thing is, I think we can have both. I think we can say why we're doing it and still hold one another accountable for doing better. It, it's not saying we can't do better because this happened. Look what the white man did. No, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is if you don't know what was done, you can't fix it. You can't change it. You can't address it because yeah. you'll go along thinking you got a bunch of people that just think black men are just naturally inherently violent. And that's not the case. I've oh. proven through, through the uh, rites of passage that the second most prevalent influencer on African-American adolescent and young adult male violence is the lack of proper socialization. We aren't preparing these young men to face what they are going to go through as a black man. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. So I fully they, agree with you. I fully yeah. agree with you, brother. I'm just, you know, just, yeah. uh, you know, asking that question Actually, to the person what left that question yeah. in, 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 in the comments because you pretty much, you know, broke things down in, an, in, 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 an, in a nutshell, you know? So my question to you guys, I see a question in the comment section. And so this is Rhonda and she's pretty much asking, what are some steps in starting the healing process between black men and women? So I want you guys to just speak on the men perspective, like the, the, from the angle of the black men, what are something that, some things that you guys, from your observation um, can say, perhaps the brothers can do towards the healing process or bridging that gap between um, the, the woman and themselves? First, Bridging it. Go on. Go, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, well, maybe, I, I think one thing which would be good is, you know, a, a lot of the times there are either sister circles or there's brother circles. I think there needs to be more uh, brother and sister circles together, where oh, oh. you know, that's that's you know, I'm just putting it out there. So I've, I've, been, in, I've been in some of those. <laughs> I'm sorry, and I came out saying we might need to do this separate for a little while before we come. Okay. I'm just saying, I I've been in some of yeah. those, and it is D depending on who's delivering. For each side to hate each other. It's yeah. Sorry, go ahead, brother. Yeah, and it, it depends on um, uh, as I said, what framework is being presented. Um, like for example, um, there is. So basically, I'm just going to give this as an example. So um, if there was a, a a man and woman which are both placed together, one thing which they one thing which um, you know, I've done in the past, and this is something which, you know, I'll be using when I, you know, when we when we start our, our, our um, Zoom circle sessions is writing down uh, five things which you feel which would affect the other person. So writing five things each which you think which will affect the other person and um, writing down five things which you like about the other person and so forth. This is just something just something simplistic to start with because it's kind of at least creating um it's just breaking that mold of you know um taking those you know the brother and sister outside their comfort zone but also getting them to identify um their pros and cons 
Mm-hmm. You understand where I'm coming from. And once you can identify, once both brothers and sisters can identify the pros and cons, then we're at least making um, some sort of progress because a lot of the times we can't identify our own issues unless that mirror is being placed in front of us. Or if we're, put, we're being play, put in that position where we can um, do the actual work. You know, um, so I, it's interesting because I've never been in those <laughs> um, situations you've been in, um, uh, Sister Hanif. I've just heard about, you know, sister circles and brother circles separately. Yes. But a lot of the times we can't. Um, somebody has their volume up. If you our own your issues, volume yes, all down, that'd be helpful. Get some feedback. Um, Brother Rick, it, this um, Cassie on the stream brought up a good point. She says, allowing women to be explore their feminine energy requires vulnerability, but this system will not allow time for us to be vulnerable until we heal our individualized pain in order to build together. So my question is, how do we heal in the midst of a war zone? <laughs> I mean, cause that's a real thing. It's like every other day, uh, you know, we, we, it's almost like, you, you know, we got to lo- watch out for landmines. And so how are we healing and at the same time watching out for landmines? Here is my take on this. And I've literally been studying this dilemma for probably at least two and a half decades. Uh, so this question doesn't stump me at all. It's going to take work, but here's the thing. I'm going to lose, use a physiological analogy to, to make my point. If you go off and you're running through a jungle and you're in a war zone, whatever, whether you are being chased by a tiger or a bear or uh, you, you, whatever, you know, you study putting your hands on rocks, you're climbing. What happens is you're going to start a different type of healing process than the average person. The average person cuts themselves. They don't do anything with that piece of their body until it heals. And it pretty much heals with a slight scarring, no real. But what happens is when you're consistently re-injuring before you heal, you start to callous. Mm. It makes you rough, hard, and harder to injure, but also harder to experience anything soft because you can't touch or feel. So you tend to be a little more rough and rush. So what we actually have to do is understand roles. We, 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 we're so out of our element because it's been forced upon us. They use the division to create a situation that forced black women to take on roles they weren't uh, inherently designed to take on. And now there's this battle for certain spaces that's... that we, we don't understand. So what actually has to happen is the black man, and, and this is the part, this is why I get a lot of pushback because black men feel like when I tell them this, I'm not hearing their side. What I'm saying is there comes a thing in any situation where there's conflict, somebody has to be the first to say, okay, you know what? This isn't working, I'm gonna do this. As the black man who has declared himself king and wants to be referred to as king, wants to be referred to as the head. You're, I tell people all the time, we've been commodified. As black men, we've been commodified. If we can't provide, we, nobody looks at anything else we can do. Yep. So what, what happens is we forget that, bef- I, tell, I tell everybody, before I'm a provider, I think I do a pretty good job at that, but before I'm a provider, I'm a protector. That's my number one role. Nothing happens to my wife or my kids under my watch. Absolutely not. If you and, and one of the things that happened when my wife and I got married is that was this kind of conflict with our family because I became the go-through. And even with our older kids, you got to go through me. She's not going to experience all of that. So you go through me. And what that means is you can't come with that BS. Mm-hmm. So that means I'm checking it at the door. But what happens is when that happens with the black man, I tell, I tell black men all the time, you want to see the black woman do some extraordinary stuff? Give her a space where she feels safe. And what will happen is when she gets that safe, she'll heal. When she doesn't have to fight every day, when she doesn't have to wake up and go to war, when she ain't got to figure out how to pay the bills and stay and teach the kids and love the kids and change the kids, when you give her that space and says, baby, you're safe now, I got you, she'll heal. Here's the beauty of it. She'll turn around and pour back into you and heal you. 
Somebody has to be willing to say, I'm going to put a stop to this and stop pointing finger. But the problem is we've been trained to blame. So we're looking for the blame. Something I'm going to share this with you and I, I'll be done for the night. My, I was reared by my great grandfather, who was the son of a sharecropper born in 1909. Second grade education, one of the wisest men I ever knew. And um, he told me something. He always taught me a lot. But when I was 17 years old, he stopped me coming in. He said, sit down, I'm going to talk to you. He said, everything else I've taught you, I hope you've got. But if you get this one thing, you're going to be, it's going to take you a long way. He said, you're in one of three places in life. He said, you're either going in a storm, in a storm, or coming out of a storm. He said, son, the first thing you're going to want to do when you find yourself is in that storm is to find someone to point the finger at, to blame. Don't waste your time. 99% of the time it's you. He said, what your number one responsibility is, is to come out of that storm a better man than when you went in. Let the storm shape you. It can't destroy you. Let it shape you. And so my thing and my, my challenge to men is to start allowing the storm to shape you. Our women need us. It's not about who's wrong. I hold women to the same culpability that I hold men. But I understand, and I, and, and I say this all the time, we will only get as high as our women can spiritually elevate us, but we will only get as far as our men can physically lead us. Mm. We need to know our roles. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Good stuff. Um, Brother Ola, you want to, um, Ola, you want to um, take us out with any parting words? Well, as I, as, as I said, this, this um, conversation doesn't stop here. You know, it's something which needs to be um, mm -hmm. ongoing. And, you know, as people who are seen in, in the community as, you know, those who are influential, um, we need to make this much bigger. You know, we need to make this, we need to continue to make those connections and so forth. And as I said, I've got an event virtual event next week, Saturday, with uh, the theme, how can our brothers protect our sisters' well-being? Mm. So, you know, these conversations will continue, you know, not just with my event, but with, you know, whoever what, you know, um, decides to, you know, take that stance. You know, Sister Rhonda does her, um, has, has done a couple of um, um, Zoom group sessions with her um, group, the Black Awakening Movement, which, um, you know, speaks about similar topics and so forth. So we need to continue to, you know, have these dialogues in order for us to, um, you know, just, just to get the message out there. So our brothers and sisters can see that there's, 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 there's more than one side, you know. Yeah. Somebody in the comments um, before you brothers before we leave out, um, someone is asking if any of you guys have any male support groups. Uh, we have a couple of local in the Houston area here in the U.S. Um, and I am actually currently working on building a national network uh, with uh, an extension of Black Man Lead because uh, with Black Man Lead we deal with uh, ages four to thirty. Uh, the rite of passage takes place at age of 13, but we also deal with everything that follows. Um, so we're dealing with those brothers, but yeah, we are working on creating a national network. Uh, I think one of the ways that we are handled is that we are proximally isolated, even though we have all this technology. People in, I mean, we're at some levels, we're isolated to the neighborhood we live in. And we have access to one another on a global scale, but we don't access it and use it properly. Absolutely. Um, on my side, we've got um, an initiative called um, My Brother's Keeper International, um, which is quite new. And um, we've got our online program, which is launching the end of February, uh, which will uh, provide tutorials, workshops, um, for um, brothers from 18 plus who are vulnerable and can help with their um, well-being, their self-development and their healing and so forth. So uh, I am, you know, um, currently bridging the gap 
with uh, brothers and sisters from different um, parts of the diaspora, you know, to, um, you know, make this, make this happen, you know, because in order for us to be uh, more effective, we have to, you know, we have to expand, you know, just like, you know, brother just mentioned, we have to expand. Yeah, Ashe, Ashe. And I just want to say um, to the sisters out there, uh, as it relates to our brothers, um, the advice that I would like to share is to um, just be more open to hearing our brothers, hearing them. You know, it's a lot of times that, you know, we get the point the finger scenario came up and uh, I see a lot of that, especially on social media. They point the finger, the brother can't even broach, you know, his opinion without, you know, if it has anything to do with the opposite sex women coming down hard. And I see it on both sides, but I'm just speaking to my sisters in particular. Um, you know, sometimes it's best to just allow people to vent. You know, that's, that's part of the healing process. You know, we may not like, uh, it may not feel good to hear and it may not come out, you know, in the proper context. And, you know, it might burn a little to hear it or read it. But I think, you know, if we, if we do more asking each other questions, as opposed to um, so, Dr. Here. Pain, uh, pain. inviting you and welcoming you, you know, so you hurt and it's in, it hurt you. So in return, you right. put him back. As opposed to asking the question, why do you feel that way? What makes you say that in building and in, in, in opening up an opportunity for dialogue as opposed to if we do that, <laughs> you know? So that would just be my only advice. If you, you know, just, you know, if you just be more mindful of your responses to the brothers, because as um, I think brother Rick mentioned, you know, trauma, tra traumatized people cause trauma to other people. So, you know, if, 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 if somebody's hurting you, that trauma is coming from somewhere and we got to understand it before we can move towards steps to, to fix what the problems are. So that's just my advice. And I thank you, brothers, so much for coming on. No, we thank you. Thank no, you. thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, it was sir. Definitely an honor. Mm -hmm. For me, I just I would just say, um, being that this is part two and the last <laughs> segment of this particular topic, uh, we really need to um, provide safe spaces for our rehumanization process because we are people that have really been dehumanized for a very very long time and yeah no one else uh, is brothers and sisters humanize us we have to rehumanize ourselves and that means allowing each other to feel right because with women with us we often don't think our brothers have a right to their feelings which is dehumanizing them um so it's just we need to really create safe spaces in our relationships and when i say relationships i don't necessarily mean like love relationships you have cousins, you have nephews, you have uncles, you have grandfathers, you know, whenever, wherever we can, just providing safe spaces where gentleness and patience and understanding is present so that we could just begin the process of redefining and rehumanizing ourselves. We've just really been dehumanized. And a lot of, a lot of the ways that our sisters perceive our brothers is almost like animals, you know what I mean? And so we kind of have to really be careful about that because we are going to be, if, we, if we're not, we find that even those of us who are conscious, we're contributing to our own demise. We're actually working with the enemy against ourselves. We're, and, we, and we actually don't even realize it. So really just creating those safe spaces amongst ourselves, first starting with the, with the, um, the nucleus, which is the family unit, you know, start having conversations with each other and in spaces where there is no attack, where it's just understanding, you know, and allowing each other to talk because that's um, a step towards just us rehumanizing ourselves. Okay. Okay, family. And again, thank you so much. A special thanks to Ola for coming all the way from London, talking to, I know it's a five hour difference. So we thank you so much, brother, for um, you know, no, you, sacrificing your time. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, and Rick, thank you again. Thank you so, so much. And I appreciate you both. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. So
we always ask if, if you heard anything in this discussion that hit home for you or that you think other people can benefit from, share, share the information. It does not, none of us any good for the information to just sit there in your box. You got it. If you got something from it, well then share that, spread that love and allow somebody else to be blessed as well with the information. Okay, family. Join us on um, the Empower Hour talk show on Facebook. And we're here every Monday, live 8 p.m. with a whole brand new different topic of discussion. Take care of each other. Peace. Peace and love. Peace and love. Out. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement. For those who have followed me for any stretch of time, you know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace here dropping in on you. First of all, I want to thank everyone for all the love and support that you have given uh, and sent my way and my wife's way and the organization's way. Now, I want to just take a brief moment to remind you that we still need your support. We still need your help. Go to the description box of one of our videos and see how you can support the work we're doing. Keep supporting, keep loving us, and we're going to keep loving you back. Have an awesome day.